What would you think if I told you that the United States Air Force is trying to change everything to change nothing? The novel you are referring to is almost unknown in the English-speaking world, sir. Um, okay, but listen to this. In 2019, Will Roper, the Air Force acquisition czar, flaunted the idea of a new digital century series of combat aircraft for the 21st century. In 2021, the then Air Force Chief of Staff General Charles Brown proposed to develop a simpler and lighter aircraft than the F-35 to replace the F-16. And then the Hushkit website used this to create the F-36 Kingsnake bubble. Then we had some silence, but recently, in June 2024, General David Olvin, the Air Force Chief of Staff, questioned about the NGAD, the new Super Duper C Generation fighter aircraft, answered, The deliberations are still underway, there's been no decision made, we are looking at a lot of very difficult options that we have to consider. The same General Olvin in July 2024 discussed the concept of a notional light fighter, shifting the philosophy from a build to last to build to adapt. And don't even get me started about the Navy's FAXX, which is having its share of issues of different nature. Uh... Okay, now please don't tell me in the comments that nothing has changed because clearly something is happening. And stop telling me that when other countries will come up with fifth generation equivalents, the United States will be already on the sixth generation. So this is what we know from the high echelons of the Air Force so far. As you can see, the driver seems to be a combination of several factors. Some are technology related, some are cost related, some others to the military doctrine. But there is an additional complexity dimension in this story, which is the US politics. With the presidential election coming this November, a change of administration may have a non-negligible impact. Trump has always had a different attitude towards the military and the use of force, and if he wins, we may expect some changes. These are highly polarizing subjects where the approach is completely different depending on which side of the political spectrum the narrator is. And this is where Ground News, which is sponsoring this video, becomes really, really useful. Ground News is a website and an app that gathers related articles from more than 50,000 sources around the world in one place, so you can compare how different outlets cover the same subject. Every story comes with a clear breakdown of the political bias, credibility, ownership, and then headlines of the sources reporting, all backed by ratings from three independent news monitoring organizations. You can learn more by clicking my link, ground.news slash millennium, or scanning the QR code here. For example, look at this story related to the war in Ukraine. Trump vows to end Russia-Ukraine war if elected, won't say if he wants Ukraine to win. This story has been covered in plenty of news outlets. As you can see, 71 did it, 18 leaning left, only three leaning right, Okay, now look at the titles if I select leaning left. Trump won't say if he wants Ukraine to win, a warning as US offers new show of support. Or rather, Trump insists Russia's war should end, but he won't say if he wants Ukraine to win. But if you click on the right, well, first it's interesting that there are so few right-wing outlets that cover this piece of news and two of them are actually Russians. If you look at the titles, this is a relatively simple and almost aseptic. Trump says he can end Russian war in Ukraine. And if you look at the Ria Novosti piece down below, he actually is actually saying Trump answered the question of whether he wants Ukraine to win, which is exactly the opposite of what the left-leaning has said. I think this is really telling, and without a tool like Ground News, you will never be able to spot this. Moreover, if you're interested to the conflict in general, Ground News also has specific subject pages to stay up to date, not only for Ukraine, but for 
many different subjects. Ground news is very important for my research since I try to be as factual and un unbiased as I can about something that is often neither black nor white. Ground news helps me understand the bigger picture by providing comprehensive reporting from diverse sources. Now go to ground.news slash millennium or scan my QR code to subscribe today. If you sign up through my link, you'll get 40% off the Vantage plan, which is what I use to get unlimited access to all the features. I think Ground News is doing a great job and I hope you'll check them out. Please support the people who support me. Okay, if you're watching this, you probably already know what the NGAD is. So I want to explain that the Air Force in 2014, even before that the F-35 IOC was declared, started working on the concept for an F-22 replacement. I'm also sure you know that they came up with the idea of a family of systems with the principal component being a manned aircraft called the Penetrating Counter Air, PCA for short. And you have heard before that it should include broadband stealth, adaptive propulsion and all sorts of science fiction technologies that excite the average nerd. Technology demonstrators have flown in the past few years we were all waiting for the contract for the full-scale development that had to be assigned in spring 2024 and then instead of the contract out of the blue we got the deliberations are still underway there's been no decision made we're looking at a lot of very difficult options that we have to consider uh, thank you Otis the main push toward this change of tack was cost. The estimates put the piloted NGAD at $250 million for the acquisition, which is already a lot of money, and, and God only knows the potential lifetime cost. However, I believe that there is something else at work here. The notional light fighter discussed by Olvin was slightly smaller and lighter than the F-35, but still a piloted platform. The underlying idea is that since so much of the aircraft capability depends on software, the software should be very easy and quick to upgrade in very fast cycles, while the hardware evolves much more slowly or eventually not at all. Being cheap and small, losses can be accepted more easily, even in the context of large-scale operations, and being cheap, the aircraft lifespan can be shorter since a larger number could be procured. Moreover, it could fill the niche for low-end flight, which is still a requirement, saving flight hours of the high-end platforms. The aircraft itself will be light but not simple, that is, it should retain the key capabilities being already baked into the F-35. The Air Force is not new to this idea of a light fighter, the F-16 was supposed to be one, but it was turned into anything but. It was very successful in the end, but it was no more a light platform. Please notice that what we are seeing here, it is a three-tier Air Force for the next 40-50 years or so. A top-end piloted platform, the likes of the F-22 now and the PCA in the future, a mid-tier represented by the F-35 and a low tier of light fighters. This is new and unprecedented in the last half century. No use to say there have been a lot of pushbacks to this option. Look up what the Mitchell Institute is thinking, for example, and various papers and studies have been published against this approach. This idea of versatility is not new in the American debate. In 2019, the then Assistant Secretary of the Air Force for Acquisition, Technology and Logistics, Will Roper, launched the idea of a new digital Century series. The reference is to the Century series aircraft of the 50s, where in a few years, several different models of aircraft were fielded, leading to an unprecedented progress in aerospace technology. The idea was to iterate different designs whose lifespan should be around 10 years to be quickly replaced by new models. The design should be incremental rather than starting from a clean slate every time. Moreover, some of the designs may be specialized aircraft rather than multi-role. The aircraft will not be built for upgradability because it will be quickly replaced by new models. 
many different smaller designs mean also a distribution and increment of the industrial capacity that today relies only on three giant firms. Overall, the cost and importance of a single program and the cost of the single aircraft would be reduced, so it would still be possible to produce in relevant numbers and lose aircraft without damaging the force too much. This is different from the light fighter model, but it is yet another way to achieve the versatility and development agility that larger platforms may lack. Some more clarifications on this change of tack came from other interviews with high-ranking officials. And by the way, if you want to see the sources I use for the videos, this is a perk I reserve for patrons and members. After a video, I often publish a list of the sources I use that can be easily accessed by the public. In some cases, I have private conversations and these are obviously not listed. But anyway, this could be a good opportunity to start supporting the channel if you can afford it. So, I was saying that at the beginning of September 2024, other US officials pointed out how one technology has progressed more quickly than expected and through the NGAD program assumptions of balance. And they were referring to the CCA. The Collaborative Combat Aircraft is a large program aimed at producing a combat UCAV, which is autonomous and capable of collaboration with piloted platforms. The aim is to provide each piloted fighter with two sidekicks that could execute various tasks. They could transport additional weapons, or could be used as ISR platforms, or they could be put in a harm way to preserve the piloted aircraft. These will be small, but they won't be simple. They will have high performance, long range, and a suite of sensors and weapons comparable with a piloted platform. In April 2024, a contract was assigned to Anduril and General Atomics to produce the so-called Increment 1 vehicles, that is, the first function in CCAs. However, it is already clear that an Increment 2 will soon follow because, as we said, the technology is quickly progressing. So it seems that this realization put the NGAD in jeopardy. The NGAD was always intended as a family of manned and unmanned systems, but since the unmanned part has come so far, maybe the manned part is not needed or is needed in very low numbers. The aerospace community at the beginning of 2024 has been taken by surprise by this decision. Some sources reported that high-level executives in the aerospace industry were literally baffled by the decision. I understand them, they were looking forward to another cash cow, it was likely already added to the budgets that maybe it is not going to materialize anymore. The three aerospace giants, Lockheed Martin, Northrop Grumman and Boeing, profit the most from large programs that span many decades. These are cost plus contracts footed by the armed forces that produce a large income stream for decades, first with the aircraft development and production and then with the aircraft sustainment. Therefore, there is a large lobbying effort to push the legislators towards this kind of monster programs that produce what we see today. A light fighter with a considerably shorter lifespan and fewer or no hardware upgrades doesn't appear to be as profitable. Some elements of the Air Force correctly see this as a problem because there may be only few manufacturers and the barrier to entry for anyone other than the three giants is too high. New competitors cannot emerge. There would be a solution which is fragmenting the giants in different autonomous companies and maybe even nationalizing some of them, but well, this is not the American style. However, there is another class of issues that is pushing the Air Force towards something simpler and less expensive. They feel that they are underfunded. No jokes, they really do. They do because they have sunk immense amounts of money in the program for the new ICBM. They do because albeit the B-21 seems a very well-managed program, it is still a very expensive aircraft and a relatively large number is required. They do because, even though only a restricted number of people know what is really going on with the SR-72 program, my guess is that it isn't going to be cheap. 
They do because the CCA program that was supposed to produce cheap and attritable aircraft is not cheap and attritable anymore. At 30 million per airframe, you really think twice before sacrificing one. And finally, they do because the cost of the F-35 fleet is much higher than expected. The acquisition cost is relatively low due to the production scale, but the cost per flight hour is very, very high. So the cost of the aircraft lifetime is eye-watering. Moreover, the maintenance cost of the aging fleet that should have been integrally replaced by the F-35 is increasing too. Older aircraft require more maintenance, so their support costs increase. That's obvious. So basically you are replacing something very expensive with something very expensive. And don't even get me started about the lack of pilots or the cost of setting up the new bases in the Pacific. How all of this could happen is everyone's guess. My take is that this is not even an Air Force's problem, it is a general American Armed Forces problem. The US Navy in particular has been fascinated with hardware, esteems technical competence, and is prone to trying to overcome its tactical deficiencies with engineering improvements. Indeed, there are officers in peacetime who regard the official statement of a requirement for a new piece of hardware as the end of their responsibility in correcting a current operational deficiency. Thank you, Otis. So this refers to the US Navy, but it could be easily translated to the Air Force and other armed services. It is a typical American trait to look for technological solutions to every problem. This is in part understandable because in the sky it is much more difficult to hide. It is a level field where the environment has less relevance than in land or maritime engagements. The obvious flip side of the coin though is that you must be sure that your technology is clearly, undoubtedly, completely better than everything else you are encountering on the battlefield. Because otherwise you won't be capable of recovering, it will just take too long. This is not me saying there are Air Force's documents where they ask for funds to dominate their battle. The stated purpose is to maintain an overwhelming technology superiority against every conceivable opponent. Probably they are excluding an alien invasion, but otherwise. Obviously, this means keep running forward, trying to develop something new in a never-ending effort to be the best. So maybe, just maybe, they got to the point where this push for better and better equipment starts showing drawbacks and diminishing returns. Cost is the obvious one, but not the worst. For a country like the United States, money is not a scarce resource, at least for now. The worst part is that the increasing complexity means exceedingly long development times, exceedingly long production times, long lead times and scarce flexibility when in need of ramping up the production. Not to mention the often low production numbers that make every loss a small catastrophe in terms of force effectiveness and reputational damage. I mean, look what happens with the F-35. Every time there is an incident, it makes headlines in the press. Being one of the most technologically sophisticated aircraft in the world, this is not expected to happen. Actually, the aircraft incident record is statistically very good, but the reputational damage that it gets every time there is an incident, it is not inconsequential. So, what will happen now? Well, if I had to guess, I would say almost nothing. The NGAD will go forward with reduced requirements to save some money and some complexity. Nonetheless, it will still be very expensive, very complex, it will be late and it will be built in low numbers. When it will finally start working, it will be probably extremely effective, like American weapons often are, but it will show all the drawbacks we have discussed in this video. The Air Force has, within its ranks, the capability of thinking outside of the box, but the traditional culture and the economic interests revolving around such a program will inexorably prevail. I guess that the CCA program and other unmanned platforms will have a role in this when the CCA becomes operational and, if it is as effective as expected, it will occupy the niche of a light fighter so there will be no need for smaller or specialized piloted platforms. 
Thank you very much for watching this video. It was a honor to have had your time. Please, if you can, only if you can, consider supporting the channel on Patreon or by being a member or in any other way that suits you. There is also GoFundMe available, which is actually connected with a book I am trying to prepare. Please check all the links in the description. If you can support the channel, which is perfectly fine, please do the other YouTube stuff like subscribing if you are not, hitting like or dislike if you didn't like the video, hitting the bell if you want to be notified when a video comes out. This is helping immensely with the algorithm. So thank you so much for watching from me and Otis and see you next time. Thank you.